on everyone. Um, I am here to train myself in delivering another lecture for my expressive culture class that I am reading this semester at UT. And usually I'm giving hi. Usually I'm giving uh, this lecture to my plush cats. Привет. And, you know, um, I just had this idea of giving this lecture to my friends on Instagram. And so I have my plush cats now from one side and you on the other side. And if you will allow me, I will just plunge into, into our process. So, as I said, this is a training recording. It is not even uh, directed specifically to the internet audience or whatever. It's directed at uh, students of UT. So, thank you for giving me this opportunity to train myself in your presence. So, usually I begin with, uh, you know, good day everyone. Today we are having the fifth lecture in the Expressive Culture class. I'm hoping you are doing well and had a good conversation during your discussion sections on Friday. So last time we grappled with some of the difficult ideas of Judith Butler. And last time actually I had this video uh, leave as well on that particular lecture. Some of these ideas and the big takeaway kind of from the last lecture is that not everything is so easy with the contemporary agreement that sex is something biological and gender is something social. Um, because there is no way of talking about sex without using gendered language. We talked about performatives as opposed to constitutives and that gender could be performative, at least in the, in the Judith Butler's uh, world, it is performative, right? And you can develop, I will tell them, your own theory of gender. Uh, you don't have to rely on theories for everything, but if you're going to develop your own theory, it is always good to know what others said, who already theorized about it. So they would, uh, by tomorrow noon, would have uploaded their writings, which are the first writing assignment that they had. And I'm going to congratulate them. Hello. Congratulate them on accomplishing this writing. Uh, because, you know, if you complete the writing, even if it's not yet uh, graded or in the sense that um, when we are talking about people who are not students anymore that is not yet read, it does not matter that much because you have already completed the thing. Things can always be better or worse than the actual writing that you produced, but you completed it, you met the deadline. This is what is actually important. Um, you kind of still have to know how the world is going to perceive it, but what is important is that you actually accomplished it. This is a reasonable cause for celebration. Approve yourself of these little steps, they will eventually lead you to your goal. In this case, for them, it's their degree, one thing at a time. Um, so I will explain then that as far as grading is concerned, I will not have the date next time, but I will tell you, I will tell them the next week when they should expect the grading exactly. Yeah. Um, so, 
I hope you will agree with me that your writing deserves a thoughtful evaluation, thoughtful feedback to move you further in your process. And the reason for that is that they also have the second and the third writing assignments that are built on the first one. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I will orient them that in four more weeks uh, on the 12th, 12th week which is April 9, your second writing assignment is due. Um, yeah, I'm planning to ask them um, when they would like to receive this writing assignment, because the first one uh, they received uh, two weeks in advance, and I will ask them if that is working well for them. Or maybe they would just want one week to complete it. Okay. Uh, so today I will tell them we are not going to have a quiz, but instead I will ask them to fill in the form that will allow us to correct uh, the course if needed. Um, I will ask them to give me a short mid-semester evaluation of this course. And the questions that I created for them are as follows. First, I feel good about my first completed writing assignment. Agree, disagree. And uh, the second question, this class is A on a heavy side, B on a light side, and C is about right. And the third question, I feel comfortable speaking up in this class. Agree, disagree. And then optional two questions are what I wish was better about this class or what could be better about this class, one or two sentences, and what works for me particularly well about this class or what I like about this class, one or two sentences. And uh, in my career as a student myself, I only encountered one professor who did a mid-semester evaluation and it's kind of, um, I understand it's a drag for most people, like maybe you don't want to spend time on that. But I actually felt like I'm seen, heard, and understood, and I want to provide my students with the same experience. Um, so I will give them time, I will stress that this is anonymous, they don't have to sign it, they don't have to leave their IDs on the sheets. I will thank them for giving their answers, I will study these answers attentively, and if I am able, I will adjust the course. I mean, of course I will not uh, change the syllabus, for example, if they tell me that that's too heavy, I will just concentrate on um, explaining things more and kind of slowing down and providing additional information about every point that we are trying to work through. But maybe they will say that that's okay. Um, so now I'm going to talk to them after that about the film that we are about to watch, and it's a controversial film, what it's called, right? This will be the seventh week of this course. The theme of the lecture is performance of queer self, and some of the questions that I announced last time... Hi! Um, ...are what part of our identity is our gender? What is gender? How is gender constructed? What are the regimes under which gender proliferates? And something tied more closely to the film is um, how does a queer self exist in the world of compulsive heterosexuality and what expressions does it take? And how do humans limit the totalizing power of gender in their performance of self. And in addition to gender and sex issues, we will kind of 
try to consider the question of sexuality today. We should think about the regimes of the compulsive heterosexuality as well as the regimes of compulsive monogamy that we were trying to do when we were reading Esther Perel. And how this regime structure the world of the gendered and sexed bodies, the way that these bodies struggle with their belonging and identity. Some people struggle more and some people struggle less. It is not always because of the intrinsic qualities of these bodies, but sometimes it's because the structures of culture are so rigid that they demand particular forms of expressions or particular forms of performance or performativity if we are to use Butler's vocabulary. And these demands are not merely wishes but there is an apparatus that is in existence that regulates those bodies in certain ways. The truth-making machines, as Melissa Gregg calls them, and the psychiatric practices and bullying, as Butler named them, in the video that we watched last time. It is an interesting way to think about bullying, right, as a powerful regulating mechanism, uh, the apparatus in society that is organizing the flow of subtle and harsh microaggressions and aggressions that accumulate into the atmosphere where it's sometimes impossible for people to survive and they resort to suicide because they do not fit for whatever reasons, including the reasons of not being gender conforming or having a sexuality that is being read as queer. Now, we will not delve too deeply into the historiography of the term queer, but you know that there is a body of scholarship on queerness. Sometimes it is a term that applies, and other times other people feel like it's a misnomer, it has its own politics to it. For example, the native scholar Kim Talbert finds that queer is the term um, that some Native American societies uh, never implemented, you know, you, you were never kind of a body of a body that is queer, this notches in the society consisting of straight bodies, uh, but rather it was a kind of a version of the norm. So these are all terms that are culture specific anyway, they have the history to them and they are not necessarily universal. Um, but they do circulate in the realm of the worlds familiar to us and sometimes they maybe make it easier to speak about things and maybe not. So the film Paris is Burning was directed by Jenny Livingston, born in 1962 in Dallas. She grew up in Los Angeles and graduated from Yale. Um, to produce this film, Livingston first raised about $250,000 and then there was music from the PA, PA systems caught in the film that kind of forced her to raise more money so that she can cover the, you know, the expenses connected to the copyright issues. Um, in her interview, Livingston said that the movie is about, quote, how we are all influenced by the media, how we strive to meet the demands of the media by trying to look like Vogue models or by owning a big car. And it's about survival. It's about people who have a lot of prejudices against them and who have learned to survive, survive with it. Survi survive with wit, dignity and energy. It's a little story about how we all survive. So this is what she said. You will have find here parallels with the critique of the contemporary society driven by conspicuous consumption, characterized by the culture of insecurity, 
suspicion and technology mediated paranoia that we encountered in the works by Alice Marwick, Melissa Gregg and others. And also this film is driven by the critique of the cultures of compulsory heterosexuality and compulsory monogamy, the critique of which we encountered in the works by Esther Perel and Judith Butler. I'm noticing these are all female names and I want to highlight that in the, all the more so since the second part of this semester we will be studying works by anthropologists who happen to be men. I am aware of this and I think that this is a fair reflection of the gender shift that goes from the past into the future. The film depicts the life of the so-called ball culture in gay and transgender black and latina community in new york city and explores the intersections of race sex sexuality and gender representation it was praised and received awards and it was one of the films that constitute the movement known as new queer cinema at some point independent filmmakers on queer practices and often created by queer people. Ball culture or house system or the ballroom community are all the terms that are referring to the structuring of the way of queer communities living in which people walk in gatherings, present themselves, I mean they form certain communities and win awards and trophies. It's a subculture, you could say, subculture, and we haven't yet the chance to define this term, even though we've already kind of mentioned and used it. Um, these are the, do there are the dominant societal structures, hegemonic cultures, you know, within which sometimes subverting them and sub sometimes in contradiction to them. Um, Sometimes in conversation, other movements can emerge that could become subcultures or countercultures. They emerge sometimes in protest and sometimes in a kind of um, hmm, collaboration, you know, with this kind of um, bigger discourses, if you will, right? Um, and they're kind of engaged in playful relationships with these hegemonic structures and these playful relationships are of different degrees of, um, you know, seriousness, let's say. Sometimes these terms, subcultures and countercultures, could also be used by the hegemonic structures to define something that exists in, in opposition to them, you know, to kind of distance it from these hegemonic structures, right? So to place a phenomenon in the rubric of subculture, um, we kind of often eliminate a certain dimension of its complexity. Something becomes or is supposed to become clear about it, right? So the, ba the ball culture is an agglomeration of the elaborately structured sets of values, norms, behaviors, performances, rituals and hierarchies. And film explores the issue, these issues in connection to racism, violence, racialized and gendered violence. I forget how you say this word. AIDS, can you say that? The film demonstrates how the so-called houses become surrogate families for the people rejected by the families for their non-conformism. As we said, 
Already, gender norms are difficult to subvert, it's difficult to resist the dictate that they place on bodies. You will see how these gender norms enact themselves over and over again in a culture that resists them. The community that is portrayed in the film is not necessarily any freer than the community that accepts the hegemonic heterosexual discourses uncritically because, of course, everyone has been brought up with the same overarching dominant ideas. But it definitely reflects on these issues and struggles with them rather than taking them for granted. And in this sense, it is definitely counter-cultural. It offers an alternative to the existing culture, mirrors it to a degree, plays with it, rejects it, and transforms it. There is a wide variety of identities in this film, with some people fully transitioned, others receiving partial surgery, like breast implants and not vaginoplasty. Yet the third identity here is drag queens, which is the type of performers who impersonate the represent representatives of the female gender with exaggerated markedly feminine features and behaviors that are perceived by performers and by the audience as feminine. Yet others in this film are gay men passing for straight men and praised for the ability to do so in daily life, and so on. So there is a great variety of self-representations, and each of them shapes the way the person is perceived by the society within and beyond the ball culture microcosm. The reason why we need to look at it and to watch it is because there is no way other than by looking at people's everydayness that we can learn to appreciate the complexity of their and our own existence in the world. And this film achieves the portrayal of everydayness in all its spectacularity and mundaneness. Now, of course, this kind of film could not uh, be left out of critique. As you imagine, it was critiqued from multiple perspectives, including but not limited to the perspective of the conservative Christian fundamentalists whose angle of perception I suppose is known to everyone here. And of course they were unhappy about it. Also there was an argument about the money after the film was made and one of the houses featured in the film maintained that they didn't receive a fair share of the earnings from the film. <coughs> <laughs> so, there's kind of a, a, a lot of um, conflict around this film that is titled Paris is Burning. There was a critique of sex is portrayed in the film, the Livingston, and Livingston maintained that as a queer filmmaker herself and as a woman she was held to higher standards than too many male directors will ever face. Since her film was full of the images of queer people, she knew that she was going to attract a lot of this unhealthy attention, you know. And she also knew that she was going to get substantial cri critique as to how the people are portrayed in their vulnerability. And, you know, the ideas of awareness or wokeness, if you will, they are kind of all the time advancing, and they are very demanding, with new and new critics making more and more nuanced points. And these points are important. For example, Bell Hooks, a feminist writer of great renown, author of several books including Wounds of Passion and All About Love, these are her books that I read, and that's why I am mentioning them, but she is the author of many books, she noted that the film, in fact, makes a celebratory spectacle out of the subversive cultural practices of gay black men and men of color. In the article Is Paris Burning, Bell Hooks says, When I first heard 
that there was this new documentary film about black gay men, drag queens and drag balls, I was fascinated by the title, she says. It evoked images of the real Paris on fire, of the death and destruction of a dominant white Western civilization and culture, an end to oppressive Eurocentrism and white supremacy. This fantasy not only gave me a sustained sense of pleasure, it stood between me and the unlikely reality that a young white filmmaker offering a progressive vision of blackness from the standpoint of whiteness, these are all, you know, um, quotation marks that she's giving us, Bell Hooks is giving, would receive the unlikely reality that a young filmmaker would receive the positive press accorded Livingston and her film. So basically what she says is that this reality is unlikely. Yeah, she shouldn't, Livingston shouldn't have received the positive press if she was to portray truly progressive vision of blackness from the standpoint of whiteness, you know. Watching Paris is Burning, Bell Hooks continues, I began to think that the many yuppie-looking, straight-acting, pushy, predominantly white folks in the audience were there because the film is in no way interrogates whiteness. In no way it interrogates whiteness. These folks left the film saying it was amazing, marvelous, incredibly funny, worthy of statements like, did you just, didn't you just love it? And no, I didn't just love it, she says. For in many ways, the film was a graphic documentary portrait of the way in which colonized black people, in this case black gay brothers, some of whom were drag queens, worship at the throne of whiteness, even when such worship demands that we live in perpetual self-hate, steal, lie, go hungry, and even die in its pursuit. The we evoked here is all of us black people slash people of color who are daily bombarded by a powerful colonizing whiteness that seduces us away from ourselves, that negates that there is beauty to be found in any form of blackness that is not imitation whiteness. If you are interested to learn more about Bell Hooks' critique, this is from her book Black Looks, Race and Representation. I want to note that I have written her name without capital letters here because this is how Bell Hooks writes her name, which is a pseudonym. Well, I will have, you know, powerpoints. As you see, she doesn't mince words one bit. And at the same time, you must, might say, well, this passage is about black gay brothers, some of whom were drag queens, as Bell Hook says, but some of the characters in this film perhaps do not identify themselves as men. I am making this point to continue talking about gender and how elusive it could be. Again, Bell Hook speaks from the face of all of us black people slash people of color, but this is perhaps not necessarily the same positionality. But then again, I'm not in a position to critique it. And again, I want to highlight that I find Bell Hooks' critique very important here, and I want to radically embrace it. Judith Butler writes about the film and engage, engages with the Bell Hooks article. In Butler's book bodies that matter on the discursive limits of sex where sex is also in quotation marks there is the chapter titled genders burning like everyone liked the title of the film genders burning questions of appropriation and subversion devoted to the film 
Butler objects to bell hooks reading of the productions of gay male drag as misogynist, which is another point that bell hooks is making. Uh, and yeah, so the production of gay male drag as a misogynist act, you know, by mimicking the exaggerated female features or the features that are associated with the femininity. Um, there is this uh, old feminist view of this practice as inherently misogynistic and bell hooks, according to Butler, kind of subscribes to this. Uh, and Butler says, quote, The problem with the analysis of drag as only misogyny is, of course, that it figures male to female transsexuality, cross dressing, and drag as male homosexual activities, which they are not always, and it further diagnoses male homosexuality as rooted in misogyny. The feminist analysis thus makes male homosexuality about women, and one might argue that it is extreme. This kind of analysis is in fact a colonization in reverse, a way for feminist women to make themselves into the center of male homosexual activity, and thus to reinscribe the heterosexual matrix paradoxically at the heart of the radical feminist position. Such an accusation follows from the same kind of logic as those homophobic remarks that often follow upon the discovery that one is a lesbian. A lesbian is one who must have had a bad experience with men, or has not yet found the right one. So now you have a glimpse into some of the complexities that surround the film. I brought here some of the critics' perceptions for two reasons, to give you the view on these complexities and also to demonstrate to you that there is a certain field where the conversation is happening. There is a discourse surrounding the production and reading of such cultural texts as documentaries in general and documentaries about queer or gay people or LGBTQA communities in particular. We will not untangle all the complexities and contradictions now. Here we merely scratch the surface. I encourage us to look at this film, to watch this film, with a critical perception and the open mind and to arrive to our own conclusion. Finally, before we plunge into watching the film, let me tell you two words about the next week, for I will not want to ruin the impressions that you will have from the film by bringing you back into our context right away. After we watch the film, you can be free and leave. Next week is the beginning of the segment of the course titled Broadening the Horizons. Before we had been talking about the familiar worlds and everyday practices in our culture, and now we go on into talking about cultures that are markedly not ours. And of course there is this problematic, uh, that's a problematic division, but I feel like it's important to make it here, because um, the course is expressive culture, you know. We are studying cultures here. If everything we've been talking about before was applying to our daily life and anyone in this class could be the subject of the talk starting with the next week, we will talk about people's cultures to which we do not belong. The cultures of travestis, for example, Brazilian prostitutes. The culture of the ingot who cut heads the Balinese entertaining themselves with cockfight, and so on. We will look at how the figure of the other emerges in our study of culture and anthropology, and what work it does. Sometimes it's a detrimental work for our understanding of the humanity of others. We will be dealing with the questions, some of which still pertain to the issues we were working through last week's 
such as in what ways sex and gender are social and or biological, how is gender performed and expressed in daily life in our cultures and elsewhere, and we will also look at what are ethnographic methods and how they allow us to study culture, what does anthropologists do in the field and why, how colleagues, interlocutors, travestis, construct their gender and what does this tell us about gender in general. We will be talking about their specific practices like injecting silicone in their bodies, industrial silicone, that they inject in, in very particular places of their bodies and in the way that they perform femininity. Furthermore, the shift that we are enacting the next week with our studies is that in the first part of this semester we delved into media studies, philosophy, robotics, technology, new media, communication, and starting from the next week it is all about anthropology. The authors that we will read in the remainder of the semester are all sociocultural anthropologists, with the single exception of Benjamin Lee Worf, who is a linguistic anthropologist. Okay, I don't, I don't uh, have any more uh, time. Well, I will tell them that the next week we are reading uh, the introduction in the chapter 2 from Don Kulik's book, a travesty, sex, gender, and culture among Brazilian transgender prostitutes. And if you are interested in this, I would definitely recommend you find this book. And after this short presentation, I will show them the film Paris is Burning that they get to discuss during the Friday discussion sections. And I should thank my friends uh, here on Instagram for their patience and for their attention. You helped me a lot. I feel like after I'm giving these short presentations, I am all ready to go to class and have a productive discussion, hopefully. Okay.